Well, welcome to Raider Church on this rainy night. Can we just thank our volunteers who are outside? I, I heard some of them. I heard some of them were giving like piggybacks to people like into this place so that their shoes wouldn't get wet or messed up or something. I, I, I don't know, but that, that's, just, that's just incredible. So, so welcome tonight. I want to welcome those of you watching online. I'm sure there's a lot more of you watching online uh, tonight that couldn't be here with us uh, tonight because of the weather. We're pumped you guys are joining us right now as well. Got a question for you. Don't, don't raise your hands or anything, but, but question for you tonight. How many of you have ever faced like like the odds stacked against you, whether it was maybe coming to college, maybe no one in your family had ever been to college before. And some of you are maybe like the first generation in your family to come to college. The odds were, were stacked against you. Maybe you've been on a sports team before and, and you were down and it didn't look like you were going to win, but, but the, and the odds were, were stacked against you, but you, you came back and won. I'll never forget uh, when I was uh, playing baseball growing up in Little League, um, I was an all-star this particular year, and uh, I, I, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but, but I was an all-star. And so um, my team was, was in the, the playoffs, and uh, we, we were down by three runs. And this pitcher uh, was incredible. We had faced him in the regular season and uh, my, my team had gone into the playoffs and we faced this pitcher and he just destroyed us. I, I mean, just, just absolutely murdered us, just striking us out one after the next and, and they beat us badly. And so we're, we're on our all-star team and, and we're facing the all-star team from this other league and we're going against him again. And we're, we see this guy and we're like, oh my gosh, um, we're, we're, we're going to lose. Like the odds were totally stacked against us. And so we're, we're down by three and um, I, I come up to bat and um, I hit a grand slam. And we went up by one run and we ended up winning that game. And my mom was yelling and screaming so loud in the stands that she peed herself in the stands. Like she peed in her pants. She was yelling so loud and she was so excited that she, just, she peed everywhere. So the odds were totally stacked against us and, and we overcame those odds. Um, I overcame a lot of odds to marry my wife, Darby. Um, I kind of rank popularity into three tiers. At least I did in junior high and high school, okay? And so there's like three tiers. And if you were a three, you were like the most popular, okay? And, and I was kind of in the, 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 the second tier, okay? I, I wasn't like super popular, but I wasn't like unpopular. And so I thought of myself kind of in that second tier. Darby was in the third tier, okay? She was in the third tier and uh, we were friends. She was kind of, I was kind of one of the little people that she was friends with in the second tier. Um, and so, so I liked her and, and we were friends and we, I wanted to date like all the time. And, and she wasn't really too into me. She was dating guys in the third tier. Of course I was in the second tier. So I was friend zone material, but I wasn't dating material. And so the odds were really stacked against me. I liked her a lot, uh, but they were stacked against me then to make matters worse. My wife, Darby, wins homecoming queen and prom queen in the same year, okay? This is the girl that I married. And I know some of you are like, bro, how did that happen? I get it. I get it. I don't know how it happened. The odds were totally stacked against me, okay? Thank you, God, uh, that you came to my rescue and helped me win the third tier kind, kind of girl. Okay, I was in the second tier. So, so he, he, by his grace, he enabled me to, to marry someone who's in the third tier. So the odds were stacked against me. Years ago, I had gained a lot of weight after college and after I got married. And uh, I started working out again for the first time in, in a long time. And I had an addiction to Dr. Pepper. Any of you guys know what I'm talking about? You go see the doctor multiple times a day, okay? And um, I did too. Me and Dr. Pepper were really good friends. We were best friends, actually. I mean, I would have several, like, large, big gulp, Sonic, Route 44, Route 44, however you say it, size Dr. Peppers a day. Like, I loved Dr. Pepper, okay? But when I started working out, I got off sugar for a while, I started eating better, and I had to get off Dr. Pepper, okay? The odds were totally stacked against me because 
You know, if you've ever stopped drinking Dr. Pepper, you go through withdrawals like you were on crack. I mean, I couldn't sleep. I had headaches. I couldn't sleep. I was irritable. My wife, Darby, was kind of like, why don't you start drinking Dr. Pepper again? Like, this is getting out of control, okay? You're, you're too whiny and complaining all the time. You're just too irritable. Like, you just get, you start, start drinking it again. So the odds were stacked against me. But in about 11 months, I lost 50 pounds. So the odds oftentimes are stacked against you. And some of you may be in a spot like that right now. Like you feel like the odds are stacked against you. Like the odds are not in your favor. It may be the classes that you're taking. It may be the major that you're in. It may be the, the job that you want. It may be a dream that God has put on your heart. It may be a person that you've been praying for and, and sharing with, and you want to see God do something in their life, but you, you, don't, you feel like that's so far off for, for, for that person. Or maybe you've always wanted to share your faith, like share the gospel with someone or pray for someone out loud. And, and you look at those kinds of things, and you're like, I could never do that. The odds are stacked against me. Well, in this series, we're talking about chasing lions, being lion chasers. And we said last week, and we're saying in this series that oftentimes it's those God ordained opportunities that we have to step into that are often scary lions that we have to step into in order to experience God's ordained destiny, his best. And oftentimes those scary lions mean the odds are stacked against you. They're not in your favor. And so what do you do? Well, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're looking at a guy named by the name of Beniah. There's a story about him, a short story, short passage in 2 Samuel 23 that talks about a guy named Beniah. And the odds were totally stacked against him. They were not in his favor. But Beniah was a lion chaser. And even though the odds were stacked against him, he chased after this lion. And he stepped into, as a result, God's ordained destiny for his life, his best for your life. And listen, regardless of how the odds may be stacked against you tonight and whatever it is that's going on in your life or in your family or in your finances or whatever it might be, regardless, with God's help, you can step into that opportunity and seize your God ordained destiny with God's help. And so we're gonna look at more of that tonight. Second Samuel 23. If you don't have a Bible, go to RaiderChurch.com. The verses are there, select like sermon notes and, and it'll link you to where our, the verses are for tonight and, and some of the points you can follow along with us as we go. But Second Samuel 23, starting in verse 20, it says this. There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from the tribe of Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which including kill, killing two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once armed with only a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hands and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors in Israel. The odds were stacked against Benaiah. I mean, when he went against the, the two champions of Moab, it was two against one. The odds weren't in his favor. When he went up against the Egyptian, other verses tell us this Egyptian was like a giant, like he was seven and a half feet tall, which meant like in boxing, he had probably about a two foot reach advantage on Benaiah. The Egyptian had a spear, whereas Benaiah only had a club. So Benaiah was outgunned, he was outmatched. The, the odds were not in his favor, they were stacked against him. And then with a lion, with this lion, check out some of these things. Here's some, just some facts about the, the lion. He, and, and remember this, he, he didn't have a rifle, okay? This is like hand to paw combat. You see what I did there? Sorry, it's a dad joke. It went over some of your head. I'm sorry. So, so they're, in, they're in combat. So check this out. A fully grown male lion weighs hundreds of pounds more than a grown man. Probably 400 pounds. Most male lions weigh 500 pounds 
plus. A male lion leaps about 30 feet in a single bound, okay? Men don't do that, all right? We, we don't jump 30 feet in a single bound. A lion can run about 35 miles an hour. That's a lot faster than us, okay? It's a lot faster than me. Its jaws are powerful enough to bite through bones. Its canine teeth are used to rip through animal hides. Its vision, a lion's vision, eyesight, is five times better than a human's, giving the lion a significant advantage in this poorly lit, dim lion's pit. So a lion hunts everything from wildebeest to giraffe. So Benaiah is just a, a small, easy prey for this lion. They're fighting in the lion's pit. So, so the lion has home field advantage. They're fighting in his home, in his pit that he lives in. And then to make matters worse, it's a snowy day. So the footing wasn't great. And so the four-footed lion with his giant paws and cat-like reflexes had a huge advantage over Benaiah. A hundred to one, a thousand to one, a million to one shot for Benaiah. The odds were stacked against him. Watch what Mark Batterson says about Benaiah in his book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, which this series is based on. Watch what he says. But Benaiah did what lion chasers do. He defied the odds. He didn't focus on his disadvantages. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't try to avoid situations where the odds were against him. Lion chasers know God is bigger and more powerful than any problem they face in this world. They thrive in the toughest circumstances because they know that impossible odds set the stage for amazing miracles. That is how God reveals his glory and how he blesses you in ways you never could have imagined. God loves impossible odds. And we see this pattern throughout scripture that, that God waits till it's like humanly impossible situation. And just in the nick of time, God will often come through and do what no man could do. But we see this pattern often in, 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 in the scripture where, where God comes through when it's an impossible situation just in the nick of time, because we see in God's character and in his personality that God loves impossible odds. Now you might be thinking, you're saying, Clayton, you're saying that God might allow the odds to be stacked against me so that he can show me his power and his glory and, and his strength. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what the scripture tells us that often God will allow the situation and the odds to be completely stacked against you so that you will trust in his strength and not in your own. And so that you get to watch God do the impossible right in front of your eyes. You may have heard of a guy by the name of Gideon. In Judges chapter seven, Israel's going to war with the Midianites. And Gideon's the, the leader of Israel at this point. He's the, the judge in this day and this time that they had judges that would rule over Israel and they would lead them into battle. And so Gideon is the, the leader of Israel at this point. And uh, Israel is going to war with Midian. And, and Gideon has 32,000 soldiers. He's got 32,000 troops. And he's going to war against Midian who has many thousands more than he does. And so the odds are already stacked against him. And so God comes to Gideon and says, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're about to go to war. You, you've got too many soldiers. And Gideon's like, uh, what? You, you meant I, I don't have enough. Like you're going to send me some more troops, right? And God's like, no, you've got too many. And Gideon's like, uh, okay. And so God tells Gideon, tell all the soldiers who are afraid to go to battle that they can go home. So Gideon tells the troops, hey, if you're afraid, you can, you can go home. You don't have to stay and fight the Midianites. Two thirds of the army walk away. And Gideon is left with 10,000 troops. 
And you know, Gideon just had to be thinking, okay, I've got 10,000, but that's still a lot. Like we're outnumbered 10 to one, uh, 20 to one, but, but we've got 10,000, like we've got our, uh, our, our shields and our spears. And, and, and so we can, and our swords, we can, we can do this. And God's like, no, you, you still got too many. And Gideon had to be, God, you're crazy. You're nuts. What do you mean I've got too many? They outnumber us 10 to one. How can I have too many? And God says, you've got, you've got too many. And so Gideon tell the, the troops to get a drink of water and watch. And when they get this drink, those who go down into the river with their face first and, and, and drink the water like a dog would from the river, send them home. The ones that cup the water in their hands and put, bring it up to their mouths as they watch and they keep watch as they, as they get a drink, keep those. And so Gideon watches, he sends home all the troops that get down into the river with their face down in the water to drink the water. He sends them all home and Gideon is left with 300 soldiers. God's just stacking up those odds. Some of you probably feel the same way. God, are you seeing what's going on? The odds, they just, they just keep stacking up. Like, I don't get it. What are you, where are you? What are you doing? The odds are getting worse, God. And if that wasn't enough, God tells Gideon, to go to war with the Midianites instead of with spear, shield, and sword with trumpets and jars. And so at this point, you know Gideon has to be like, God, is this a joke? This is a joke. You want us to go to war with trumpets and jars? What are we going to do with those? But because of Gideon's faith and trust in his God, he tells the troops to put down their weapons and they're going to war with their trumpets and their jars. And you know what happens? God completely routs the Midianites in front of Israel. God does it all. The odds were completely stacked against them. It was absolutely impossible situation. But God came to the rescue and with his own strength and might, he defeated the Midianites right in front of the Israelites. Israel saw a huge, mighty miracle right in front of their eyes because they trusted that God would deliver them, that God would rescue them. And you might think, why? Why did God do all of this? And here's what God tells Gideon. You have too many warriors with you. And if I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. God didn't want Israel thinking that they could save themselves by their own strength, by their own power, by their own might. That would have taken all the glory away from God. You see, God allowed the odds to be stacked against them even more so, and then more so, and then more so, so that he would receive glory and honor from the victory so that Israel wouldn't think that it was by their own strength. They would know that with only 300 soldiers, with trumpet and jars, they would know that God rescued them and that it was only by his strength and his power that they made it out alive. You see, God will often do the same thing in your life. He'll allow the odds to be stacked against you and then stacked even more against you, and then stacked even more against you, so that when God comes through and rescues you, you will see and realize it was only by God's strength. You couldn't do that. It wasn't you that did that. It wasn't by your own wisdom or strength or might or power. It it wasn't because of you. It was that God came through and rescued you and performed a miracle in front of you. You see, God loves 
impossible odds. And here's why. God loves impossible odds because it sets the stage for amazing miracles. God loves impossible odds because it sets the stage for an amazing miracle that you get to watch, that you get to experience. You know, God would oftentimes when people would come to him, or uh, Jesus rather, when, when people would come to Jesus and say, hey, my, my family member's sick, my friend's sick, he would wait. Timing would be of the essence, but, but Jesus would wait. If you know the story of Lazarus, Jesus is told that he's sick and, and, and he doesn't go immediately. He, he waits and, and Lazarus dies and everybody thinks it's too late. But it's never too late for Jesus. Not even death. The odds being stacked against you, talk, talk about death. When Jesus shows up, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, will live. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the grave. There's another time, there's another story where uh, this, this family's daughter was, was sick and, and dying and they come and tell Jesus and, and Jesus arrives after she's already died and, and he gets there and he goes into the room and, and he, he says, she's not, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they all laugh They're like, Jesus, you're crazy. He, she's, she's been dead for days. She's not asleep. And the Bible says, that they laughed at Jesus. And so the next thing that Jesus did is he took all those people out of the room, all the people that didn't believe, all the people that were laughing at him, he, he, he told them all to leave and he kept just a few people in the room with him like, like Peter and, and John and he raises this little girl back to life. He says, get up. And he brings her back from the dead. There was only a couple of people that got to see that miracle. Those who trusted in God. Those who didn't laugh at Jesus when the odds were, were stacked against him. God loves impossible odds because it sets the stage for an amazing miracle that only he can do. Mark Batterson said in his book, too often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our lives. Like, like God, reduce the odds. They're, they're, these things are stacked against me. The situation is tough. It, it, it's hard. Can you make it easier? That's a lot of times that's what we're, we're praying. We want everything in our favor, but maybe God wants to stack the odds against us so we can experience a miracle of divine proportions. Maybe faith is trusting God no matter how impossible the odds are. Maybe our impossible situations are opportunities to experience a new dimension of God's glory. Maybe our impossible situations are opportunities for us to experience God's glory and His power. You know, I've got three kids, Levi, Coben, and, and Nixon. And I love watching my kids. Like I, I could watch them do nothing. And, and if you, when, you, when you're a parent, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. I, I could watch my kids sleep because I love my kids. I could watch them do anything and just sit there and, and watch them and enjoy them and be proud of them even as they do absolutely nothing. Because I love my kids, I, I love to watch them. But it's also fun to, to watch your kids do something when the odds are stacked against them. Or when they're scared. This year, Levi played basketball, he's, he's 10, he's about to turn 11, he played basketball for the first time since he was like four or five. And I told him before the season started, I said, Levi, you haven't played basketball in a long time. A lot of these kids have been playing basketball like for years and they can dribble and shoot and pass the ball. You know what I mean? They can, they can play basketball. You, I, I wasn't trying to discourage him. I was just like, you, you don't play basketball. You can't. He's like, dad, I want to play. I'm like, oh, okay. He's played baseball. He played football this past year. And have you ever seen a, a kid that, that's used to football start playing basketball? It's absolutely hilarious. It, it, it's the funniest thing in the world. Some of you guys know, you, you're, maybe you were more of a football player and you got on the basketball court and you're just a bruiser. I mean, you're just injuring kids, okay? That was Levi. Um, <laughs> the first couple of practices we, we saw, oh, he's still got the, the football stuff in him, okay? He's knocking kids to the floor and they're, they're crying and they're hurt, okay? And, and so 
we were, we were just dying. I mean, we were just laughing like this, this is hilarious. And so, but he never played, ba- he hadn't played basketball before since he was four. So he really, he really hadn't played. And, and so he gets, he starts playing and he's getting a little bit better. And, and sometimes he shoots the ball and he's, he's big for his age, but he would shoot the ball and he would literally, he would launch it over the goal. Like just clear the whole thing. Like not even, I'm not talking about hit the backboard or the rim, like just completely over the goal. And so we're like, Levi, you got you kind of have to ease up, you know, but he's football, you know? So, so we tell him to ease up and he, he gets better. And then he's, we work on his shot and, and we work on some moves. He's a bigger kid. And so we were working on some post moves uh, uh, for him and practicing. And, and so he's getting better and better. And he's playing defense and he was playing amazing defense, of course, because the kids were scared of him. They didn't want to get knocked to the ground. And so, but he could steal the ball easily and he would get rebounds like constantly. And, and because he was right under the goal, he could put him back up and, and score. And so he ended up scoring. He ended up being like the second or, or, or third leader leading score every single game. He had tons of rebounds, tons of steals, tons of fouls. Um, and he learned how to foul out for the first time. And, 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 and so that was a new experience. That was a learning experience. So, so we had to learn how to not foul out of a game, you know, so that, that was good. And so, but by the end of the year, we found out that Levi, because of the way they did the all-star voting, had been voted many times to be an all-star. It's probably because they knew that he could take out the best player and they wouldn't come back to the game. But, and he, he didn't make the all-star team, but he got voted a lot of times. And we were told many, many different times that, you know, it's his first year, but, but man, he was so effective on, on the team. And he, he was such a huge part of, the, of his team. And they went far in the playoffs. They made it to the semifinal game. And Levi had a lot to do with that. It was his first year. And man, we just loved watching him. We loved watching him knock kids to the ground left and right. And we loved watching him score because he had never done this before. The odds were completely stacked against him. And man, we loved watching him play. Last week, my son Coben was playing baseball and my son Coben, Levi's real competitive. Like he's, he wants to be good. Coben just likes to be out there to, to meet people. Okay. Like he was on the basketball when he played basketball, like he would be out there and meet kids and they're like juking and playing their own little game, like on a, a whole other side of the court. Like they had no idea what was going on. Coben just likes to be out there and to play and to socialize. Okay. So, so he'll be out in baseball and he's like going up and talking to his friends in the field. And it's like, oh, there, it's a game, buddy. There's a game going on. Like you got, you got to play the game. And so but man, we, we love watching him play baseball, even though it's not really something he cares about. But last week, his team's down by two runs. And there's one out, it's the last inning, we're the home team. And he goes up and strike one, strike two, we're like, oh gosh, here it goes. He's gonna strike out, we're gonna lose the game. Next pitch comes and Coben smokes this ball to the fence. He's eight years old. He hits it to the fence. We've never seen him do this before. I mean, he's never hit anything like this before. The kid, the kid in front of him scores. He ends up scoring a home run and we won the game. It was a walk-off home run and Coben did. I mean, I was up on the fence. I ran up to the fence watching him round the bases with this huge smile on his face, just laughing. I don't even think he knew what he did, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm holding onto the fence and I'm yelling, run, Coben, run. And he's going around the bases and he scores and they win the game and everyone's you know, so excited. My, my wife Darby and I looked at each other, we started crying, we couldn't believe it. And it was baseball, it's not life or anything like that, but it was amazing to watch our kids do something when the odds were stacked against them. And you know, I think because the Bible says that God is like this perfect father, that when his kids do something with his help, when the odds are stacked against them, I think he's looking down, he's saying, look, I think he's nudging angels in the side and their in their ribs with his elbows. I look, look at my look at my son, look at my daughter, look at what they're doing. The odds were stacked against them. 
My wife, several years ago, in her early 30s, sorry, babe, I meant your early 20s. She still says she's 29. Um, But several years ago, a, a mom of three, we'd been out of college for a long time. She got her degree in human development and family studies here from, from tech. And, and uh, really her, her, her dream for most of her life had been to be a wife and, and a mom. And she was getting to live that. But then God put a, a different dream in her heart. And in her early 30s, she decided that she wanted to be a trainer, a personal trainer. And so she didn't just want to get like any certification. She wanted to get like the best certification. And so she, she went out to my knowledge and, and she got the best one that you can get in our country. So she basically went back to school for a year. She was studying almost every day in our kitchen. I would come home for lunch or, or come home from work. And before the school, the kids had gotten home from school or before she had to go, then she'd be studying all day long. And, and, and she took a test that most people take like three times before they pass it. And she passed it on her first try. And then after she got this certification, it was time to to start training people. So she had to kind of put herself out there and and she decided that she wanted to do this class for ladies that lived in our neighborhood. And it met at this town hall place in the middle of our neighborhood. And so she started this class and we were both scared because we had no idea if this was gonna work out or not. We'd spent a lot of money for her to go back and to do this and to get the certification. And she had to travel some to, 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 to do this and to, to get the right uh, certifications that she needed in order to do this. And so, so she starts this class and, and she kind of puts herself out there by messaging a bunch of people and posting about it. And within a day, the, that time had filled up. And so she, she started another time and that time filled up. And so then this is her first step try at this, she ends up in the first month she's doing this, she's got three different classes and they're all almost full. She started training some people one-on-one at the the gym that we go to. And before long, within a few months, she, she had her own business. God put a new dream in her heart and the odds were stacked against her. Just because of her time, she, she had three kids and she had to go back to school basically and she had to study a, a, a lot and, and take these hard tests and then, and then to put herself out there and, and to start this new business. And, and man, I just, I just think because God is such a, a good dad, he was looking down at her and saying, look at my girl. The odds were stacked against her, but I put this new dream in her heart. And she didn't run from that lion. She chased it. She chased it. And now she's got this thriving business with all these classes, her own location now, where she's training all these different people at, 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 at gyms and stuff all, all across the, the city. And not only that, but God has put her in a unique position to really to be a pastor to so many different women. I mean, I can't even tell you how many women who are, who are struggling, whether it's in their marriage or with their kids and how often she gets to talk with them and, and pray for them and, and share the gospel with them. God's basically using her as a pastor in the workplace. And it was because even though the odds were stacked against her, she chased the lion rather than running from it. I think God, when he saw Benaiah go after that lion, he's like, everybody watch, look, look, look what Benaiah's doing. Look at what my boy Benaiah just did. So here's what I want you to see tonight as we close. Lion chasers defy the odds because they know their dad is with them. Lion chasers defy the odds and they can defy the odds because their dad is with them holding their hand through the whole thing. You know, Proverbs chapter 28 verse one says this. I love this verse. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but watch this, but the godly 
are as bold as lions. The godly are as bold as lions. That boldness doesn't come from just anywhere. We don't have that that boldness of a lion chaser just inside of us, just on our own. No, the godly are as bold as lions. And the way you become godly, the scripture says, we, we train ourselves in godliness, just like an athlete trains for the games or for their sport. We develop that connection, that relationship with God on a daily basis. We, through coming together with other followers of Jesus in groups like this or, or in small groups and studying the Bible and, and praying and, and worshiping and serving. And as we do that over the time, we become more and more godly and we become bolder and bolder, just like a lion. The godly are as bold as lions. And I wonder if some of you are timid tonight or scared tonight because you haven't been walking with Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want to invite you to kind of examine your heart tonight. Does that verse describe you, that you're as bold as a lion because you walk with Jesus and you know that he's with you? Or maybe you've been straying from God. You've walked away. Well, I believe tonight is your night to come back, to come back to him, to walk with Jesus, because as you walk with Jesus, you become godly. You become more and more like Jesus as you follow him and as you walk with him. And so tonight, I believe God's inviting you back into relationship with him tonight. Maybe you've been away, maybe you've strayed, maybe you've messed up, maybe you've screwed up. Man, run back to God, don't run away from him. The wicked run away, Proverbs 28 says. You can run back to God tonight because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Your sin is forgiven. First John says, if you will confess your sin to God tonight, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you'll confess your sin and come back to God tonight, the Bible says, come back to God and God will come back to you. Return to God and God will return to you. Would you return to God tonight? And I believe as you do, you'll be filled with hope and joy and peace and boldness like a lion. And if that's you tonight and you'd say, man, I wanna, I wanna come back to God. I wanna be filled with that boldness like a lion. I don't feel like I've, that's been me. I don't feel like that's been true of me. I've had, I haven't been bold like a lion. I've been away from God, but but I want to come back to God tonight and I want God to fill me with the boldness of a lion. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, yep, that's me. Would you pray for me tonight? I've been away, but I want to come back to God tonight. Just keep your hand up. It's just you confessing to God saying, God, I've been away from you, but I want to come back to you tonight. And the great news as you raise your hand is that as you confess your sin, God will forgive you and he will cleanse you. You don't have to cleanse yourself to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and then he cleanses you. God, I pray for every person with their hand up right now that you would see them crying out to you and telling you, God, I'm coming back to you tonight. Would you fill them all with boldness right now in Jesus' name? God, would you fill them with joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding, God, and a new hope that even though the odds are stacked against them, God, that you are with them. They're returning to you. And so you're returning to them, even in this moment. And you're filling them with the boldness of a lion. So God, we thank you that even when the odds are stacked against us, it's just an opportunity for us to see your glory and for us to see your power. So let's stand, stand all over this room. Let's worship God tonight because he's with us. Our dad is with us. His presence is here with us tonight. And because he is with us, we can defy the odds and we can chase the lion.